Hello everyone, today's video will, once more, be on a topic investigated by Gottlob Frege. This should be no surprise, given my main area of focus at the time within philosophy uh, is Frege's works. Uh, and specifically, I will be discussing what, according to Frege, we are to consider a proper name. And at this point, right at the start of the video, you might ask yourself, well, who cares? Uh, why is this at all relevant to philosophy? Surely what we consider to be a proper name is merely a social convention that can change and shift depending upon what a group of language users wants it to mean, right? Well, you're not necessarily wrong. However, as with all philosophers, it is important to view their investigations into certain matters in the context of their entire project. For Frege, whose primary aim was to secure the foundations for all of mathematics, this was an investigation of immense importance that, largely, he fumbled on and didn't adequately explore. Hence, a lot of recent literature on Frege has been on how we are to understand proper names in a system that works for Frege. Specifically, the majority of research on this topic, at least in my video, comes from Michael Demet's very difficult book, uh, Frege, Philosophy of Language. I asked myself whether or not this is a video worth making when people could simply read the chapter found in this book on proper names. However, I then realized that, at least from my own and other people I am familiar with's perspective, this is one of the hardest texts in the last century in the philosophy of language slash logic. Thus, I am making this video to attempt to accurately portray Frege's work through Dummett's lens in a simpler fashion and without reference to too much of the convoluted jargon that he utilizes. Now then, why is the clear delineation of what a proper name is important for Frege's overall project? Well, uh, that is a very difficult question, but I'm going to attempt to give my best understanding of it. For Frege, uh, there are only certain units found in our language that are capable of having what he terms sense. To understand what this word means, I very much encourage you to watch my video on Frege's identity theory of truth, which goes into this a little bit. However, I will be making a separate video on what sense means in comparison to other terms for Frege. Frege believed that language units capable of sense are not constructed through the combination of different incomplete expressions. One might think that the sense of a sentence is grasped through the combination of a noun like the dog and a predicate is brown. In fact, Frege argues that this is done in a completely reverse fashion. Sense starts with complete expressions, and through the removal of singular terms from a sentence, we acquire further incomplete expressions that are capable of sense. Going into more detail, Frege says that words are capable of sense through our understanding of how they are capable of being used in new sentences and the way in which we use them to respond to other sentences. In this way, the sense of a word is grasped through the way in which we use them to construct sentences. So, in reality, the sense of a sentence is made up of the senses of the words in the sentences. And I know it's going to sound like I'm saying a bunch of tongue twisters when I say sense and sentences so much. However, the sense of a sentence is understood as the way in which we can understand how a sentence can be true or false given different circumstances. Thus, our understanding of the sense of a sentence is clearly dependent upon the sense of words in that sentence, for otherwise we would be unable to know when or how a sentence can be true in any given circumstance. Let's look at an example. Uh, take the sentence, the red panda is furry. The sense of the sentence is simply the way in which speakers will know whether that sentence is true or false, the truth conditions of that sentence. However, the sense of the word red panda is simply the way in which we can use that word in various sentences and to respond to various sentences of which we have not previously encountered. But let's look at another sequence of words that is neither what is considered a sentence nor a word, but still seems to have a sense. In the sentence, every red panda is furry, the string of words is furry does have a sense. However, in the sentence used by Dummett, the emperor's carriage is drawn by horses, the string of words, some horses, does not have a sense. 
Immediately, you must be wondering, what? How can this be? Well, the explanation as to why this is is quite sticky and confusing, as most things are in the philosophy of language. However, I will attempt to briefly show Frege's rough construction of how things can hold sense. But one must simply remember this. Frege has a hierarchy of senses, and at the top of this hierarchy lie proper names and complete sentences. We call these complete expressions. Anything else is considered an incomplete expression. Let us consider our first example, with the intent to show uh, that the string of words is furry does have a sense. Something can only have a sense if it is one, a proper name, or two, is derivable from a complete sentence through the removal of a proper name or, though we will not look at this, some higher level predicate, relational or not. So we have the complete expression, which is a sentence, every red panda is furry. Immediately notice that we can obtain a predicate from this sentence, namely, Zai is furry. This is a first level predicate because it is obtained through the removal of one proper name. We can show that this is a unit of a sentence and thus capable of having sense by reconstructing the sentence through generalization. Firstly, we restate the sentence using the universal quantifier. For every x, if x is a red panda, then x is furry. Then we can replace some of our words with our logical symbols, and we now see that the units of the sentence are the proper name, red panda, and the first level predicate is furry. Now, let's look at our second sentence with the intent to show that the string of words, some horses, is not capable of holding sense. So we have the complete expression, which is a sentence, the emperor's carriage is drawn by some horses. Immediately, again, notice we can obtain a first level predicate by removing the proper name, Zai is drawn by some horses. This, however, is not the string we are seeking to ascribe sense to, since some horses is preceded in this case further by is drawn by. The fact that, under Frege's system, some horses does not have a sense is made even more clear when we reconstruct the sentence in its generalized form. Note that we must use universal generalization, uh, where x can be absolutely anything, instead of restricted generalization, where we restrict the domain of objects uh, that can be substituted in for x. The consequent of this is that we can't simply write the sentence for some horses x, the emperor's carriage is drawn by x. Instead, we must write it with an unrestricted domain, so it is for some x, x is a horse, and the emperor's carriage is drawn by x. And then we can replace some of our words with our logical symbols, and we will see that we have absolutely no units in the sentence that corresponds to some horses. So now that we have a bit of background about how senses are ascribed to words, we can now see how important it is uh, that we have a thorough understanding of what constitutes a proper name. Simply look at the hierarchy of senses. It isn't important to understand what many of these symbols mean, but it is important to understand that all expressions found in level one, what can be called incomplete expressions, are generated by the removal of one or more proper names from a complete sentence and that all expressions found in level two, also incomplete expressions, are generated by the removal of one or more incomplete expressions in level one. Thus, incomplete expressions are defined discursively by the removal of proper names from sentences. Now, I hope you have a clear understanding of how important it is to understand what it means for a word to be a proper name. And finally, we can actually begin the investigation what is a proper name? A proper name is, for Frege, a logical category. It is a specific type of linguistic entity. Linguistic, or logical categories, uh, include proper names, complete sentences, first level predicates, second order predicates, etc. Anything you saw in that hierarchy of senses and beyond. The logical category of a proper name is correlative to the ontological category of an object. That is, as Dumet says, whatever a proper name stands for is an object. And to speak of something as an object is to say 
that there is, or at least could be, a proper name which stands for it. However, if this is so, in what order do we understand one through the other? Uh, a good case of this is that of a number, which Frege considers to be an object. Do we understand a number to be an object because we recognize it as being a proper name in the linguistic sense? Or do we understand a number to be a proper name because we recognize it as being an object in the ontological sense? Peter Geech, a once prominent philosopher of language who has passed away, argued that for Frege, it is the latter. The reason we understand a number to be a proper name is because we have grasped it as being an object in the ontological sense. Consider the sentence, five is a prime number. Geech says that we view the term five and then recognize it as standing for an entity of some form. Then, based on recognizing it as standing for an entity, we grasp whatever ontological category that it stands for, in this case, an object. Finally, knowing that the term five stands for an ontological object, we can understand that it is a proper name. Dummett ardently rejects this view. He says that this is the exact opposite of what occurs. He claims that for Frege, it would, quote, be impossible to know what it was that some expression stands for in advance of knowing what logical linguistic category it belongs to. This does intuitively make sense upon critical reflection. Unless we understand the way that a sentence is constructed, that some term stands for the proper name, some other term for the predicate, it seems impossible that we could know that one term would belong to one ontological category and a different term to another ontological category. For Frege, the only way we can know what a logical term stands for is in virtue of the way we use it in our language. Thus, we can only know that, on this paper, Five stands for an ontological object because of the way it is used as a proper name in this sentence. With this understood, we can begin looking at the way in which we determine just what terms are proper names. Frege's method of arguing for what was and was not a proper name was extremely poor and required intense argumentation on his behalf by Dummett. Frege simply believed it would be intuitive as to what would be considered a proper name and what would not be a proper name. But, as we have seen, if his entire project rests on the construction and understanding of how expressions emerge and fit together, we need much more than mere intuition to ground what a proper name is. Remember, Frege's project is to rigorously define and ground mathematics in logic, a seemingly deductive enterprise not open to possible error. Thus, mere intuition on what seems right will simply not do. Demet first suggests the following criterion for, for what word can constitute a proper name. From any sentence, A of A, it shall be possible to infer there is something such that A of it. This criterion is rooted in the fact that, for Frege, all proper names can be existentially generalized. That is, one can replace the proper name in a sentence with an existentially bound variable x. Let's look at some examples. Consider the sentence, Jean Paul is in the bath. We can analyze the sentence by looking at its predicate and what we want to show is its proper name. So in this case, the predicate a is Zai is in the bath. And our proper name of a is Jean Paul. We want to determine if Jean-Paul is really a proper name, and to do this, we will apply the first criterion Dummett lays out. If it is possible to replace of A with of it and apply existential generalization, it is a proper name. That is, if we can logically infer from A of A that A of it, then it is a proper name. So we replace of A with of it and apply existential generalization and then we get there is something such that a of it replacing a of it with the units we get there is something such that it is in the bath and finally applying symbolization we can get the sentence there you go <laughs> i i 
That's the same sentence, but in symbolic form. Uh, but it should be clear from this example that it does logically follow from Jean-Paul is in the bath that necessarily so there is something such that it is in the bath and therefore Jean-Paul is a proper name in this case. Now let's look at a second example. Consider the sentence, something smells like tea. We can analyze this sentence by looking at its predicate and what we want to show is its proper name. So in this case, the predicate A is Zai smells like tea and our proper name of A is something. Following the exact same process as last time, if we can show that A of it can be logically inferred uh, from A of A, then we can say that A of A is a proper name. And so applying these same steps, we find that the word something does seem to be a proper name. This should actually give us pause. Remember the relationship between proper names and objects? For Frege, if we determined logically that a word stands for a proper name, we can rightfully know that this word stands for an ontological object. Knowing this tenet that Frege holds, we can see immediately that the fact that something is now considered a proper name is absurd. For this would mean that there is some ontological object that is represented by the word something in our language. But the word something is an indefinite pronoun, which means that it does not refer to any specific object. Rather, it stands in place of potential objects. Thus, it follows that the word something itself cannot be a proper name. Further, if it were a proper name, our first method of criterion would be circular, since we invoked the notion of something in our existential generalization. Thus, it seems, we must find a further criterion of proper names in order to rule out something as being a proper name. The second criterion that Dummett introduces is the following. From two sentences, A of A and B of A, it shall be possible to infer there is something such that A of it and B of it. Let us see how successful this criterion is at removing the possibility of the word something as being a proper name. So consider the two sentences, A of A, something smells like tea, and B of A, something smells like coffee. In the first sentence, we have the predicate, Zai smells like tea, and in the second sentence we have the predicate, Zai smells like coffee. In both cases, the supposed proper name is the word something. If something is a proper name, then it should be possible to infer there is something such that A of it and B of it from the sentences something smells like tea and something smells like coffee. So let's replace something with it and conjoin the sentences and then apply existential generalization to get the newly formed sentence. We get there exists something such that A of it and B of it. Now let's replace A and B with the predicates. So we get there exists something such that it smells like tea and it smells like coffee. And this is the existentially generalized form of the sentence. Can you see how this sentence doesn't follow from the two previous sentences? Let's look at a further test case. Consider the case where we have two cups in front of us. One is a cup of coffee and one is a cup of tea. From this fact about the world, we can state two things, that something smells like coffee and that something smells like tea. Clearly the word something in this case does not refer to the same object as it is an indefinite pronoun it doesn't need to. So by this new criterion of being a proper name, we cannot derive there exists something such that it smells like tea and it smells like coffee. For that implies that there is one single thing that smells like both tea and coffee. While in reality, there is a unique object that smells like coffee and a unique object that smells like tea. Thus, we can conclude based on this criterion that something is not a proper name. Also notice that this seems to rule out many other indefinite substantive phrases like the phrase a cow or a poet. If we have the sentence a cow is hungry and a cow is thirsty, we cannot infer that there exists something that is both hungry and thirsty, for it is possible that those two sentences refer to different cows. Thus, a cow is not a proper name. But let's consider two sentences containing 
a poet. The first is Neck was born a poet and Rawls became a poet after university. In this case, we can actually infer that something is such that Neck was born as it and that Rawls became it after university. For in this case, the word or phrase a poet is of a higher order generality. For while we have devised a criterion to rule out pronouns that are existentially substantiated like something, it is not the case that we can rule out words that are universal in nature and represent the form of something. One can imagine these terms as referring, for things, uh, referring to things like Plato's conception of the forms or Descartes' universals. This is not, strictly speaking, really what is meant by these terms, but I believe it can serve as a rough guide to better understand what types of Another criterion that Dummett introduces that I shall not show in detail is that if of A uh, is considered a proper name, then from it is true of A that either A of it or B of it, it can be inferred that a, either A of A or B of A. That is, the disjunction A of A or B of A can be inferred. This criterion is used to rule out the possibility that the word everything could be a proper name. Uh, you can go through this exercise yourself in the same fashion as the other two criterions uh, just to see how this is the case. But what of the poet case? It may not yet be clear what other sorts of phrases are capable of evading out tests that seem to obviously not be proper names. One example that Dummett uses is the policeman case, where the two sentences, Amrita is a policeman uh, and Brazel is not a policeman. I shan't show the deductive reasoning as to why this follows from the second requirement, uh, but I encourage you to rewind and try it out for yourself. Uh, in this case, a policeman is a proper name which goes against our intuitions. And you might ask yourself right now, well, what's the big deal? Why shouldn't we consider a policeman in this case to be a proper name? Well, let's analyze exactly what this would mean. If we look at our two sentences, we see that we have uh, the two predicates, Amrita is a Zai and Brazel is not a Zai, where the proper name is supposed to be a policeman. I think this should strike you as odd. It certainly struck me as odd. The reason why this seems to be counterintuitive is because in sentences that are of the basic subject predicate form, or for our purposes, the proper name predicate form, we almost always describe the proper name as that which is being talked about. That is, we use the predicate to ascribe some sort of characteristics to the subject. In the sentence, the cat is gray, we are talking about the cat and describing a characteristic about the cat. Yet in the policeman case, we are doing the opposite. We are using people to talk about a policeman. That is, we are describing characteristics about what it means to be a policeman, rather than using a policeman to describe characteristics about Amrita and Brazel. Dummett talks significantly about Frank Ramsey, a philosopher who worked extensively on the philosophy of language and truth, and if you watch my video on Frege's identity theory of truth, is considered the pioneer of deflationist theories of truth. Dummett notes that this, the policeman case, is exactly the sort of thing that Ramsey is discussing in his paper titled Universals. The paper is primarily Ramsey critiquing Russell's maxim that there exists a difference between particulars and universals, an argument found in the Problems of Philosophy, which is my recommended text for anyone wishing to get into philosophy. Essentially, Ramsey asks the question we are now posing. Why are we ascribing priority to the particulars in sentences? Uh, and considering them objects, well, we don't ascribe the same priority to universals in sentences and thus give them the ontological status of objects. Remember, Frege holds that there is a correlative relationship between proper names and objects. So if we now ascribe the logical category of proper names to universals, we necessarily, according to Frege, must give the entities they stand for the ontological status of being an object. In the sentence, Socrates is wise, what is describing what? Is wise being used to talk about Socrates? 
This is certainly the intuitive case that we generally grasp when talking the sentences of this form. Yet, can we not equally say that Socrates is being used to talk about wise? We would be assimilating Socrates under the property of wise rather than vice versa. There are a number of questions here that I certainly don't think I can adequately answer in this series of videos, since many involve higher level concepts that I'm either uh, uncomfortable with or not ready to elaborate upon. However, I can certainly point out the most pressing ones. Firstly, why should we prioritize the particular in what is being talked about? Why can we not talk about the universal using the particular? And secondly, why do we have an intuitive negative reaction to the latter? Why do we feel that it is simply not right? I think that in answering the second, we can actually answer the first quite thoroughly. It is certainly the case that we cannot use our intuitive negative reaction to the possibility of using, using universals to describe particulars in our explanation of why we shouldn't. This violates many of our commonly held epistemic values, such as the necessity to not violate the is-ought gap, as well as the fact that psychologism is generally not treated as being something that is respectable in philosophy. In fact, it was Frege who initiated the attack alongside Husserl against psychologism in his Foundations of Arithmetic. So I did not at all mean to suggest that we can use our intuitive reaction to these cases as a way of justifying not treating these universals as being proper names. However, I do believe that the reason we have a negative reaction is very much rooted in something real and necessary, rather than some sort of social or linguistic development that has shaped, uh, shaped us over our lives. So wherein does this necessity lie? Why is it that I think that it is universals that must be used to describe particulars and not the other way around? As Dummett points out, it consists in the fact that predicates have contraries and that any word we want to consider a predicate must have a contrary. Dummett says, quote, to say that a quality has a contrary is to say that for any predicate, there is another predicate which is true just for those objects of which the original predicate is false and false of just those objects of what the original predicate is true. And this is the basis for the fourth criterion of being a proper name. Dummett has an extremely lengthy paragraph laying out exactly what this is and it utilizes some very tricky and difficult, unfamiliar concepts to those not involved heavily in logic, so I'll try to do my best to use analogies and uh, use a simpler case. The first part of his paragraph shall suffice as a foundation on which to elaborate on the criterion. Quote, suppose that we have a sentence S of T, comma, U, involving two expressions T and U, both of which pass the tests for proper names which we have already laid out. Our criterion shall show us whether T or U or neither are to be considered proper names. First, we have to check to see if T is a proper name. And we do this by utilizing the following logical expression that Dummett lays out. Now I know that it's gonna be hard to understand because it's not on the screen. However, in the following example, it will obviously make more sense. So this is the uh, logical expression that must be utilized to determine if T is a proper name. There is something such that S of it, comma, anything, if and only if, it is not the case that S of T, comma, that thing. And if this statement is true, then we can say that T is a proper name. And so let's try this out for the statement, Socrates is wise. Let's first lay out exactly what our linguistic units are in this sentence. First, we have S, which is simply the proper name predicate form. Uh, we have T, which is Socrates, or of T, which is Socrates, and we have of U, uh, which is wise. And let us start by formalizing the left part of that biconditional I stated, which is there is something such that S of it, comma, anything. We can represent this with our sentence uh, through there is some, something such that he is anything. I've taken the liberty here of substituting in he for it, so it is clear we are talking about a person, though it really makes no difference. Secondly, we symbolize the right side of the biconditional. Uh, it is not the case that S of 
T, comma, that thing. Uh, so we get it is not the case that Socrates is that thing. Finally, we can join the two to make a biconditional. There is something such that S of it, comma, anything, if any, if and only if, it is not the case that S of T, comma, that thing. Thing. Uh, and this, of course, becomes there is something such that he is anything if and only if it is not the case that Socrates is that thing. For those not familiar with basic symbolic logic, a biconditional is true if and only if it is always the case that both sides of the conditional have the same truth value. So if the left side of the tr uh, left side of the biconditional is true, the right side also must be true. And if the left side is false, then the right side must be false and vice versa. If this biconditional is able to theoretically be asserted, then we can say that Socrates is not a proper name. And if it can't be asserted, then it is a proper name. And let us consider just what is going on in this biconditional. It is essentially asking whether or not it is possible for us to say that something could be anything while also not being able to be something. And this is clearly a contradiction, and thus we can say that Socrates is a proper name, falling in line essentially with our intuitions. What of whys then? To determine whether or not you or of you is a proper name, we must likewise figure out whether it is possible to assert the proposition that there is something such that s of anything comma it if and only if it is not the case that s of that thing comma you. Uh, if we can assert this, then of you is not a proper name. And here's the formalization of this biconditional. There is something such that anyone is it, if and only if it is not the case that that person is wise. Can we assert this? Yes, it is of course possible for there to exist a certain quality someone can be even if they are not wise. This is simply common sense. Thus, we can assert the biconditional and we can rule that wise is not a proper name. And with this, we are able to rule that universals are not to be considered proper names, right? Sadly, no. The next video will continue to follow this topic and explain just why this is the case. Please leave a like, subscription, and comment, as well as joining my server, uh, Scholars Retreat, and our partnered server, The Philosophy Chat. Uh, finally, I stream on Twitch bi-daily and am becoming more active on Twitter. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Adios.